For centuries, immigrants have come to the United States in search of safety, opportunity, and freedom. Early settlers came by boats from Europe, and since 1886, those arriving in New York City's harbor have been greeted by the Statue of Liberty. Inside, emblazoned on a plaque, are the immortal words from poet Emma Lazarus, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. To millions of hopefuls, this is why they still come. Today, large groups of migrants arrive in New York City on buses, much of them from Texas. Hace cuatro días llegamos. Like those who arrived before them, they have little more than the clothes on their backs. We're here because in my country, there was a lot of problems. But not all are received with open arms, as a mass movement has communities questioning if they can handle the record influx. Far from the eastern shore, the front line of modern American immigration is the southwest border, spanning nearly 2,000 miles from South Texas to the Pacific Ocean. It's seen a dramatic increase of people and drugs coming from Mexico since 2021. In fiscal year 2023, U.S. Border Patrol reported more than 2 million migrant encounters at the southern border. That doesn't include so-called gotaways, people who slipped through undetected or avoided detention. Doing document checks, vehicle checks. At the nation's border checkpoints, thousands of pounds of drugs are also seized, including a frightening rise in the deadly synthetic opioid fentanyl. But those known to law enforcement only represent a fraction of the narcotics smuggled in to the United States. Maverick County, Texas Sheriff Tom Schmerber has seen a lot in a decade as the top cop, but never anything like the current situation in Eagle Pass, Texas. It's completely different. We need help. I know that the border is being overrun. Schmerber says many immigrants self-surrender, like this group that waded across the Rio Grande to claim asylum. A large number of them will remain on U.S. soil, sometimes for years before their case is ever heard in court. Most are looking for work deeper inside the United States, where the sheriff predicts the cities will have to figure out where they fit in. Whatever is coming through here, the people that are up there, up there north, comfortable, the, the, all these immigrants are heading up there. Eventually, they're going to have problems. These migrants are taken to a hotel in San Antonio where they receive assistance from Catholic Charities after their grueling journey. This family endured horrors walking from South America in search of a better life. They were robbed in Colombia and their family was kidnapped and ransomed in Mexico. The cartel demands $9,500 on credit for their freedom, a price they will have to pay. There's a clear winner in the migration crisis the cartels. Their profits from the illicit drug and weapons trades moving across the southern border are estimated in the billions of dollars each year. It's believed they made $13 billion on human smuggling alone in 2021, and the volume has only gone up since then. It's a win-win for them. It's a lose-lose for this country. In Arizona, Cochise County Sheriff Mark Daniels polices 6,000 square miles of land including an 84-mile stretch of border alongside U.S. Customs and Border Protection. It's an active cartel operational zone that he says has been neglected by Washington. This has not been a priority. So that lack of prioritization to secure our border, we have seen everything from public safety challenges, uh, national security challenges, and humanitarian challenges. And uh, so all three boxes are checked in a negative way. Fourth-generation rancher John Ladd's family has raised cattle on these lands for more than a century. These days, it seems more people are being herded on his property than livestock. They're just everywhere. He shows us where those on the other side of the border used blow torches to melt portions of the metal wall multiple times. The cartel strictly controls who comes across the border. Marked by the dates, it's been repaired. The border isn't about immigration, it's about smuggling. Something he and everyone else around here seems to know about. It's a business.
That, and it's a big business. I noticed you said business plan. That seems like a, a well thought out kind of intelligent operation that they're running. Is it? Oh, yeah. Social media videos like this have widened the cartel's reach exponentially, advertising so-called successful migrant journeys. The cost for those coming from Latin American countries, about $4,000 per person. The number goes up to $20,000 per person for those coming from Europe or Africa. And for those coming from China, many spend between forty and $60,000 each. We're doing everything we can as a rural sheriff's office to do our part, working with our state, our law enforcement partners, state, local, and federal. I feel bad for Border Patrol. They're doing everything they can, but they've been so saturated with everything but enforcement. John Maudlin is the Customs and Border Patrol Tucson sector chief. The cartel's operations keep his agents bogged down with processing and paperwork, keeping them from focusing on their primary objective, border security. The smuggling organizations control everything, and currently they're, they're pushing them this way. The Tucson, Arizona sector has seen a 134% increase year over year in migrant encounters. And in fiscal year 2024, it's been the busiest sector in the country. These days, the cartel's reach is global. Just reaching out across the entire world and, and lying to them and telling them that it's easy, lying them and telling them that they will come here and they will be granted asylum, they'll be allowed to stay in the United States. What is it about their messaging? What seems to be getting across to the, the migrants that you guys encounter? They're savvy on both ends of this. They're savvy on reaching out to people and convincing them that, hey, the American dream is there for you, it's easy, it's safe, which is absolutely not true. Cartel outreach isn't geared only toward migrants south of the border. They're recruiting American teenagers inside the United States to help with the operation. The vast majority that we're seeing are, say, 16 to 19 year olds out of the Phoenix area. So how much are they making for one So, job? Well, what, what's advertised, I can't tell you how much they're actually getting paid, because who knows if, if it ever comes to fruition, but they're being, they're being told anywhere from $1,500 to $10,000. Per job? Yes. The challenge that we're facing really is that they're then telling them not to stop for law enforcement, to drive as erratically as possible, drive as fast as possible. So you have now accidents in these vehicles that are overloaded, people without seat belts on. So we're getting ejections, we're getting fatalities, and of course, they're, they're killing the motoring public that's just out there going about their day. Arizona has unforgiving terrain, ranging from the cracked earth desert to diverse mountains. The dry heat frequently hits triple digits and temperatures plunge at night. Water is scarce and it's easy for wanderers to become disoriented. Tucson Sector CBP monitors everything from the Arizona Air Coordination Center also known as A2C2. The cartels and the, and the guides that bring them across, they leave them stranded out there. Those who set out on foot seeking to avoid detection frequently find themselves in need of rescue. The dangers captured in photos taken by Border Patrol agents. A woman suffering from severe dehydration, another barely able to move after falling from the border wall. A single rescue operation can take up to a half a day. Assistant Chief Patrol Agent Ronaldo Rio says that's by the cartel's design. They're coached, you're gonna wear camouflage, you're gonna hide, don't call for help, and they put them in these situations on purpose to make it more difficult for us and harder for us to find them. Human smugglers exploit the crisis to paralyze Border Patrol and move their other major source of revenue, illegal drugs, marijuana, Methamphetamine, cocaine, and fentanyl are smuggled in at an alarming rate. Last year, Tucson sector had seized over 700 pounds of fentanyl. This year, we're about 150% above that already for the same time last year. Arizona leads the nation in fentanyl. 182 million pills seized last year, 111 million were seized out of Arizona. But you figure that represents probably 5 to 10 percent of all the fentanyl that's even coming across. An unknown quantity is backpacked across the border, out of law enforcement's sight. Traffickers primarily smuggle drugs through official international crossings, like at the San Ysidro Port of Entry, separating San Diego and Tijuana, where attempts to conceal the drugs often get creative. Recently we had one commingled in plastic parts for electronics and another we had within limes, uh, shipment of limes. CBP used to focus on travelers' behavior for suspicious activity, but the drug war is more high-tech these days. Canines, density readers, and x-ray systems turn up secret compartments and incognito cargo. And while the border is the front line, it isn't 
the end of the line. What we have to remember is border security is national security. Things that illegally cross the border in between the ports of entry aren't necessarily destined just for the border towns or cities. Um, a lot of times we'll talk to folks and they their final destination is much in the interior of the U.S. Fentanyl and other synthetic drugs trafficked across the border are blamed for 150 deaths in the United States every single day. The Drug Enforcement Administration says it's increasingly being mixed with other drugs to increase their potency and pressed into pills made to look like legitimate prescription opioids. In June, FBI Director Christopher Wray headlined the threat in his request for more funding for the agency. We continue to see the cartels push fentanyl and other dangerous drugs into every corner of the country, claiming countless American lives. The Bipartisan Commission on Combating Synthetic Opioid Trafficking estimates the cost of the opioid crisis in the U.S. at over $1 trillion each year. The cartels are winning. We have thousands of Americans dying every day. They don't care about America. They don't care about addictions. They don't care about us. Yuma, a city of roughly 100,000 people in southwestern Arizona, is one of the many cities and towns along the southwest border that bear the brunt of the burdens created by the crisis. In fiscal year 2022, the Yuma sector had 310,000 border encounters. That's more than triple the city's population. You solemnly swear that... Yuma County District 2 Supervisor Jonathan Lines was invited to testify before the House Homeland Security Committee last fall. He explained how much of the county's budget went toward migrant detentions. $1.3 million, uh, of which... I believe maybe we are reimbursed 10% mm -hmm. uh, or 10 cents on the dollar, I should say. Uh, but we continue to see other costs attributed to that as well. Emergency services were among the hardest hit. Line says the 911 dispatch center routinely received calls from migrants asking for rides from the border. And first responders had to respond to calls that weren't true emergencies, taking resources away from where they were needed. But perhaps nothing compares to the drain on Yuma's hospital. We have one local hospital uh, that is a community hospital. It's a land-grant hospital with a board, and they have disproportionately borne a cost of more than $26 million that has not been reimbursed. Dr. Robert Trenshell is the president and CEO of Yuma Regional Medical Center. It's not a small number, it's a big number. Especially for the hospital of its size. Yuma Regional has 400 beds and its primarily payer source, 85% comes from Medicaid and Medicare. Attempts to recoup that money have hit a dead end. Many of those cases were deemed non-billable from state Medicaid for a variety of reasons, uh, not, none of which were ours. Um, but we've not recovered any of that money, and it basically goes in the books as a loss. And it's more than just the financial hit. The hospital has been forced to prioritize care to handle the influx. For those anxious to see a doctor, that can mean waiting, rescheduling, or going to another hospital far away. We're the only hospital within three hours, 180 miles, that does what we do. If we don't take care of individuals, they've either got a 180 mile trek um, or a three hour drive to get there. So we have to take care of individuals. Trenchell wants Americans and Washington to understand the impact the migrant crisis is having on the healthcare system. If this influx is gonna be allowed to happen, then there has to be a payer source, there has to be resources for this. We're blessed here, you know, that we've been able to accomplish accommodate the volume, but we can't do that on a continuous basis. You know, it's totally unsustainable for us. El Paso, Texas shares the border with Juarez. It's a major port of entry into the United States where migrants regularly cross and surrender to the Border Patrol. The city has experienced surges on and off since 2018, sometimes overwhelming its shelters and forcing migrants to sleep on the streets. Uh, if we had volunteers, we believe we could work out the finances, although it's challenging, uh, to open some more shelters. Many of the migrants have little or no money and few options for continuing their journeys inside the United States. But in 2022, migrants across Texas suddenly had a new option, charter buses and flights to major self-declared sanctuary cities. That April, Texas Governor Greg Abbott hatched the plan amid his policy feud with the Biden White House. 
they themselves have been putting these migrants on buses to San Antonio. So I said, I got a better idea. As opposed to busing these people to San Antonio, let's continue the ride all the way to Washington, D.C. The first charter bus arrived near Washington's Union Station. It was the first of many New York City, Chicago, Philadelphia, Denver, and Los Angeles started to receive regular drop-offs. And by January of this year, Texas had transported more than 100,000 migrants out of the state. The number represents only a fraction of those migrants living in shelters and detention centers in cities and towns across Texas. But it was enough to force those cities to make substantial sacrifices. We did sit down with agency heads yesterday and ask them to start preparing to evaluate uh, ways in which they can absorb $180 million of cuts in the 2024 budget. In January, Denver Mayor Mike Johnston told city council members a tipping point had been reached and it could not accommodate every asylum seeker. We do not have space to add more folks that arrive, nor do we have staff to support them, nor do we have resources to support them. That forced Denver to contract its own buses to move migrants to other cities within the country. Denver has provided services to more than 42,000 migrants since 2022 at a cost estimated at $42 million. In 2022, that meant dipping into the city's contingency fund. And in 2023, a new border crisis response fund was created. Originally budgeted at under $10 million, million dollars for fiscal year 2024 city council voted to increase that number by 25 million dollars offset by cuts to other city agencies the country's third most populous city chicago was not prepared for the impact the migrant arrivals would have. By November 2023, 4,000 migrants had to sleep in police stations, another 1,000 in airport terminals, and hundreds were on the streets due to lack of shelter space. Earlier that year, city leaders voted to approve $51 million towards sheltering and care. While many in the city expressed a desire to help, the huge sum has caused mixed emotions for the city's residents, whose neighborhoods were already in need. I know it's right to want to help other people, because as black people, that's what we do. But when the hell are y'all going to help us? Migrant relocation costs topped $275 million in 2023. The city has only budgeted $150 million for migrant costs in 2024, a figure that is expected to go over budget. To date, Chicago has spent more than $400 million addressing the crisis. New York City is the ultimate city of immigrants, with nearly 40% of its residents foreign-born. But even a city that houses 8 million people has been stretched to the limit by the surge in arrivals. Mayor Eric Adams vowed to welcome asylum seekers with open arms, but he quickly grew frustrated. We're at the breaking point. There is no more room. Nearly 200,000 migrants and asylum seekers have been processed in the city since April 2022. Asylum seeker costs topped $1.5 billion in fiscal year 2023. More than $4 billion are budgeted for fiscal year 2023. 24, and nearly $5 billion are budgeted for fiscal year 2025. This migrant family arrived in Midtown Manhattan. They fled from the Western African nation of Angola over safety concerns. Yeah, he threatened my mom and he stole her money. He also raped and, and hit her. Anna Manuel hopes she, her siblings, and her mother can live stable lives and protect each other. They don't plan to stay in New York City for long, but they don't know where they're going next. In May, New York City started evicting migrants under time limit rules. Tens of thousands remain in hotels and shelters across the city's five boroughs. I grew up on the other side of the bridge. Vito Fasella is the Staten Island borough president and a former U.S. congressman. He says the city's so-called right to shelter decree, in place since 1981, has been misapplied and the cost has been passed on to New York City residents. We've always opened our doors to people who are fleeing oppression or tyranny, uh, and, and, and I support that. But what we don't support is saying, come on in and we'll put you up for free. The money comes from somewhere. And the money is going to come from services. Mayor Adams pins the blame on Governor Abbott for the situation. Vasella sees it differently. They said our problem is everybody's problem. 
and frankly, it became everybody's problem. But on another point, well, we the two men we agree. Immigration is a federal responsibility. It's the federal government that should have stepped up and said, hey, this is a problem. The federal government must take responsibility and lead on this humanitarian crisis instead of leaving it for cities and localities to handle. With war raging on two fronts in late 2023, President Biden made a rare Oval Office address asking Congress to allocate billions of dollars in security assistance to Ukraine and Israel. We can't let petty, partisan, angry politics get in the way of our responsibility as a great nation. With Republicans in control of the House, they told President Biden no deal unless the southern border was secured. We want to help Ukraine and Israel, but we've got to have the Democrats recognize that the trade here, the deal is we stop the open border. Biden agreed to negotiate, and in early February, a bipartisan group of senators emerged with a plan they said would reassert control of the border, enhance security, fix the asylum system, and support border communities. Senator James Lankford represented Republicans at the negotiating table. We're not getting everything we want in this bill, and some folks have said, I want everything or I want nothing. And so if we don't pass this and we don't move forward to even debate it today, we'll end up with nothing in the same status quo that we have. The bill never made it out of the Senate after former President Donald Trump told Republicans to vote against it. Aid for Ukraine and Israel. On this vote, the A's are 311 and the nays are 112. The bill is passed. Ultimately passed without a border deal. Trump celebrated the bill's defeat on the campaign trail. We crushed crooked Joe Biden's disastrous open borders bill. After the bill's demise, Biden attempted to flip the script on Republicans in his State of the Union address. And if my predecessor is watching, instead of paying politics and pressuring members of Congress to block the bill, join me in telling the Congress to pass it. We can do it together. A narrative the GOP says it isn't worried about. No, not at all. Look, the American people are with us on this issue. Immigration surged to the top of Gallup's most important problem poll in February at 28 percent, ahead of the government and the economy for the first time since 2019. 61 percent of Americans called illegal immigration a very serious problem in a February Monmouth poll. And for the first time since Monmouth started asking the question in 2015, a majority said they support building a border wall. In a repeat of 2020, Biden and Trump are once again sparring over immigration on the campaign trail. I'm moving past Republican obstruction and using the executive authorities available to me as president to do what I can on my own to address the border. Crooked Joe Biden, the worst president in the history of our country by far, has totally surrendered our southern border. Voters will hand the keys to the country to one of these men in November. And while they can make tweaks to the system through executive orders, it's the responsibility of the legislative branch to craft a functional, all-encompassing immigration strategy. David Beer is the director of immigration studies at the Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank headquartered in Washington. The most important thing that Congress should be focused on is the legal immigration structure. This meager system that we have is so dysfunctional now that no one really believes that it's a viable option. We're processing people for green cards who applied before 9-11. Remind us why we need more legal immigrants in this country. We don't have enough workers and, and a labor shortage of about 8 million people right now, 8 million open jobs in the economy that could be filled by immigrant workers if they had legal authorization to work in order to fill those jobs. The labor shortage combination with this declining population, which is going to hit tax bases and erode communities across the country. While the wheels spin slowly in our nation's capital, those who are living this crisis hope these ripples through our country will reverberate in meaningful change. Any message for Washington? I hope the folks in D.C., I say this respectfully, recognize that inaction has caused a lot of problems. What do you wish people in this country would understand about the situation at the border right now? To get people to understand that, that border security and immigration are not the same thing. That they're very different things. But the border needs to be secure. What do you need from Washington? Well, what we need from Washington is a partner. Politicians got to quit worrying about being reelected and do their job. They ought to clean house. Uh, some of these people have been in there way too long and 
nothing happens. What is your message for people who are concerned about people from all over the world coming to New York? They say there's too many people. What do you say to them? I want to say that you should give up all, all, all of people opportunity. Uh, get to know them better before you judge them. These migrants don't know what their futures hold, but they believe their long journeys will be worth it.